Uh, so uh, if anybody wants to chat uh, at any point or download any of the primary papers, the data sets, the software, everything is here at this website. Please uh, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm not a clinician, I'm a basic scientist, and I'm going to uh, talk about uh, some aspects of the cancer problem <clears throat> that I think are of fundamental interest, but also I think will have uh, implications for, um, for, for, for biomedicine of cancer. And sometimes I give a talk that's focused on this question. Uh, why, why is cancer not an issue for our various autonomous robotics uh, and, and the various uh, other kinds of things we make? And uh, this is a, it, it sounds kind of silly, but it's actually a deep, a deep question. And the answer is because uh, mostly what we make in, in our engineered constructs has a very flat architecture. In other words, the entire thing might have interesting complex behaviors. It might be, uh, have some, some degree of intelligence and problem solving and whatever. But the parts that it's made of are passive. The parts do not have agendas of their own. Uh, they, there is no danger of them you know, sort of going off on their own uh, tangent uh, that um, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't merge with, with the goals of the rest of the, of the structure. Now, that is not the case in biology. Biology has a completely different architecture. So all the way up from molecular networks through organelles and uh, tissues and organs and whole organisms and even swarms, Biology is uh, made of layers that are problem solving intelligent agents on their own. They solve problems in various spaces. This, this might be uh, not just the three dimensional space of canonical behavior, but this might be the space of physiological states, uh, transcriptional space, anatomical morphous space, metabolic space, and so on. And so all, we, we are made of, of a kind of nesting doll architecture, not just structurally. I mean, that part's obvious that each thing is made of smaller things, but <clears throat> in fact, that each of these layers uh, has their own problem solving capacity, uh, in many cases, uh, various kinds of uh, ability to learn from experience and, and uh, the, the competencies of, of various kinds. And this turns out to be very important. And so uh, a summary of everything I'm going to tell you today is basically this, that all cells, not just neurons, communicate in electrical networks that process information. And that uh, we think that cancer can be detected, it can be induced, but it can also be normalized by uh, computational models of the manipulation of the bioelectrical signaling that normally keeps cells uh, operating towards large scale anatomical goals. And if we boil all that down to one sentence, it's basically this, that like the brain, all of the tissues in your body form electrical networks that make decisions about anatomy and that we can now target the system to change the, uh, the large scale decision making of these cellular collectives. And that has huge implications for, uh, for all, all, all kinds of uh, aspects of medicine. I'm gonna show you some weird creatures today. Here's our, here's our five-legged frog. And I just point out at the beginning, this is not Photoshop. These are, these are real, um, real living forms in our lab that serve as uh, uh, our attempts to test the various theories that we have. So one really fundamental aspect of, of the cancer problem is, is how, what, what, what scale do you, uh, do you think about it at? So um, one particular uh, kind of uh, thing that people sometimes ask is, uh, you know, the, there, are, there are numerous uh, animals, the, the planaria that I'll show you in a minute, salamanders, various other creatures that are really highly regenerative. In other words, they lose a limb and they regrow it, things like that. And people ask, why do human bodies have reduced regenerative potential? And a, a common answer to this that, that people will, will advance is that it's to avoid cancer, right? So, so if you're a long-lived organism that's going to be around for, let's say, up to 10 decades or so, um, you don't want to have access to highly plastic proliferative cells because the, the, the chance of, of developing cancer is going to be too high. And so, and so the idea is that something like a human will then not be regenerative because we don't have, we, we, we're really uh, uh, keep keeping those kind of plastic um, uh, pathways really uh, uh, su suppressed. And so a perspective that's focused on specific pathways, TGF beta, to cell cycle control, all the things that we're used to thinking about for, for cancer and, and, uh, and beyond, at the single cell level predict that organisms with a high regenerative potential, meaning they have easy access to proliferation pathways, they have lots of undifferentiated cells, that those kind of animals should have a high cancer incidence. And specifically that cancer and regeneration should go together. That is, if, if the, this, this view predicts that if you are a highly regenerative um, type of creature that has lots of plasticity, you should have a high oncogenic cost. 
Now you could turn that on, on its head and make, a, make the opposite prediction. And you might say, actually, organisms that exert robust patterning control over their cells, meaning they have high regenerability, um, actually should have low cancer incidence because of this ability to control cell behaviors towards adaptive um, anatomical outcomes. And so from that perspective, regeneration in cancer should be at opposite ends of the spectrum. And in fact, augmenting regeneration may then be a promising approach to normalize cancer. And so it turns out that actually the evidence, um, all of the evidence supports this view. Animals that are good at regenerating tend to be very cancer resistant. And so that, that turns out to be interesting and important. And I wanna show you um, one, one creature um, that in particular uh, epitomizes this. This is the planarian flatworm. Um, they have a true brain. Uh, they are similar to our direct ancestor. They have a centralized nervous system. They have lots of internal organs and so on. Uh, they have this amazing ability that you can cut them into pieces. The record is something like 275 pieces. So you can cut them into pieces. Every piece knows exactly what a correct planarian should look like and regenerates uh, everything that's missing. You get a perfect little worm. Uh, in fact, everything, the remaining piece scales down so that, that everything ends up being the correct proportion and then eventually it will, it will scale back up. These guys not only are regenerative, they're immortal. They literally have no lifespan limit. Uh, they, they do, there's no such thing as an old planarian of, of this kind. Um, they are very cancer resistant. And all of this in the context of a mixoploid genome. If you look at their genomes, uh, the cells could have different numbers of chromosomes. Their genomes are a total mess. And if we have time um, later at the end of the talk, we can, we can talk about why that is. I think it's a deep thing. But, but what they're telling you is that it's possible to be a very long-lived creature uh, despite having a really chaotic uh, genome and also be cancer resistant. So um, I want to, for, for a little bit, so the first part of the talk, I want to, for, for a few minutes, just kind of think about that, that, that broader context, what, you know, uh, this, this idea of multicellularity versus cancer and, and, and what's going on here. So, so the first thing to realize is that um, I, I, th I think that the right question isn't why is there cancer? The right question is why is there anything but cancer? ever, because what we are made of are things like this. So this is a free living organism, but this is a single cell. This is called the lacrimaria. And you can see that uh, it, it's actually very competent in its environment. It's got this local little, uh, very, very tiny, um, uh, sort of a light cone of, of the goals that it pursues. And it's very competent in, in, in the control of its morphology, uh, of, of its physiology, metabolics, and, and so on. And it has little tiny single cell agendas. It's going to reproduce as much as it can. It's going to go wherever life is good. It's going to explore. It's going to feed um, and dump entropy into, into the environment. And this is the sort of thing that we are all made of. And so, so that raises an interesting question. Why do these, these kind of creatures who have lots of, uh, lots of different um, uh, competencies in their own single cell goals, why do they come together during multicellularity to do this? This is what happens um, with us. Uh, this is a cross-section through a human torso. You can see the incredible uh, complexity and order. Everything is uh, uh, most of the time in the right size and shape and position and relative sitting next to the right thing and so on. But we all start life as a collection of embryonic blastomeres. And so all of these cells have to reliably get to something like this. And, uh, and, and we need to ask the question, first of all, how, how do they do it? But also, where does this anatomical pattern come from? How do they know what to build? And the typical answer to this is, people, people say, well, DNA, you've got a human genome, so what, you know, what, what, what else is it, is it gonna build? And uh, actually, this is, this is very far from a satisfying answer because we can read genomes now and we know what's there. What's there is the specification of proteins, the tiniest uh, pieces of hardware that, this is, that, that these cells have to deploy. But there's actually nothing in the, in the genome that talks about the size, the shape, the symmetry type of the, of the organism. So we need to understand how this collective, using the hardware that it's been given by its genome, does all of the information processing needed to build what it's supposed to build, to stop what it's, when, it, when it's done. Um, how could we, of course, as workers in regenerative medicine, we ask, um, how, how could we uh, re ask these cells to rebuild a, a piece that's missing? And in particular, what happens when this amazing process breaks down? And what happens is, is cancer. And I just want to point out um, why this, 
this this genetic information is is not sufficient because you might think well we've had we've had genomics and molecular biology for for many decades now i mean aren't we aren't we getting a handle on all this and let's just do a thought experiment here's here's an axolotl larva and baby axolotls have little forearms this is a tadpole of the frog that we work with they at these stages do not have any limbs in our lab, and this is, we actually do this, this is more than a thought experiment, we make something called a frogolotl. So frogolotl is a combination of, 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 uh, of axolotl cells and frog cells, and they make a chimeric embryo. Now, we've got the axolotl genome, it's been sequenced, we've got the frog genome, that's been sequenced. Now I ask the question, can anybody tell me if these frogolotls are going to have legs or not? And you can't. And, you, and despite the fact that we have the genomics and, and, and we have some understanding of, of the molecular biology of these cells, no one can make a prediction a priori of whether these frogolotls are going to have legs. And that's because while we understand the, uh, the molecular components inside of cells, we really don't understand how groups of cells make large scale decisions about what they're going to make. Um, and this is something that uh, actually in, uh, in, in planaria is, uh, is, is a very stark problem because the species that we work with reproduce by fission and regeneration. So they rip themselves in half and then they regenerate. That's how they reproduce. And when you do that, uh, what happens is that every somatic mutation that doesn't get, uh, that doesn't kill the cell, it ends up being amplified into the next generation as regeneration happens. So, so, so they have somatic inheritance. So these body mutations propagate uh, continuously. This is why their genome is so incredibly uh, chaotic because they just keep everything that happens to them. They don't clean them the way that sexual uh, reproducing uh, organisms do. And despite all of that, uh, with, with the, despite all of this chaotic genome, they have 100% regenerative fidelity and uh, they're very cancer resistant. It, it's pretty scandalous when you compare that to you know, what, what we learn in, in um, basic biology that the animal with the craziest genome actually has the least susceptibility to cancer, uh, the best re anatomical um, fidelity and so on. And so, and so we're getting better at the mechanisms of biology, but we really don't understand the algorithms yet. And so what we're interested in are these questions. How are individual cell decisions harnessed towards large scale anatomical goals. And if we understood this, it's not just about cancer. We would have the answer to birth defects, traumatic injury, degenerative disease, uh, and, and be able to make all kinds of synthetic um, living machines and so on. So this is, this is, how, I, this is how we approach the, uh, the cancer problem. And specifically, uh, we really think a lot about um, anatomical homeostasis. The, the, the most amazing thing about regeneration is that it knows when to stop. So here's, here's an axolotl. Uh, these guys uh, regenerate their limbs, their eyes, their jaws, uh, portions of the brain, the heart. Um, they regenerate their tail, including spinal cord, um, ovaries, uh, just amazing as adults. And, and what happens is you can amputate anywhere along, along this, uh, this, 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 the, the, the axis of the limb, and they will regrow exactly what's needed, no more, no less, and then they stop. When do they stop? They stop when the correct salamander arm has been completed. So, so now it's clear that, that this is, a, as, as a collective, this structure actually has a really good idea of what the final steps are supposed to be. And, and we know that because it stops the proliferation, the morphogenesis, everything stops when they get there. By the way, this isn't just for frogs and worms. Uh, of course, human livers are highly regenerative. Even the ancient Greeks knew that. I have no idea how they knew that back in, that, in, the, in those days. Um, uh, human children regenerate their fingertips, so a clean amputation uh, at, a, at, a, at a fairly young age, if you don't sew the skin over, will eventually result in a normal, um, normal cosmetically uh, acceptable finger. And deer, <clears throat> when they regenerate their antlers, they grow up to a centimeter and a half of new bone per day. Okay, so, so, so here's a large adult mammal growing massive amounts of new bone, vasculature, innervation, skin, and so on. So um, what what we really would like to do is to move uh, from the questions of, of molecular biology and we're, we're, the community is quite good at getting this kind of information, what genes and proteins interact with each other, to really try to understand the large scale decision making of, uh, of, of, of complex organs. And you, you can think about the journey that computer science took. So this is, this is what programming looked like in the 1940s and 50s. And what's, what's uh, important about this is that you can see in order to program this computer, what she's doing is she's physically rewiring it, right? The focus is on the hardware. So, so she's there plugging uh, what, you know, wires back and forth. 
And the idea is that in order to, to control this machine and make it do something else, you have to physically interact with the hardware. And this, of course, uh, the reason we have this amazing information technology revolution is that we've moved away from that. I mean, some people still, still work on hardware, but the vast majority of us don't need to uh, have a soldering iron when, when we want to switch from Photoshop to, to uh, Microsoft Word on your laptop <clears throat> because we've learned to take advantage of the reprogrammability of the device. And so... I'm going to argue that bi biology is 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 uh, highly reprogrammable, and that this is really what we need to do. We need to move um, uh, biology and medicine towards uh, understanding that because all of the current <clears throat> excitement in the field is all about the hardware. So CRISPR, genomic editing, um, uh, uh, rewiring molecular pathways, protein engineering, all of this stuff is focused on the hardware. And the kind of the kind of software competencies I'm talking about are the sorts of things that you see, for example, here. So this is something we discovered a few years ago. Uh, tadpoles need to become frogs. And in order to become a frog, they have to rearrange their face. So the eyes have to move, the nostrils have to move, the jaws, everything has to move. And it, was, it used to be thought that this was a hardwired process, that basically every organ just moves in the right direction, the right amount, and um, there you go, you have, your, you have your frog. Well, so we decided to, to, to uh, test that idea and to see if there was in fact more intelligence to this process. How do you test for intelligence? You perturb the system in a novel way and you see if it still has the ability to have its goals met despite uh, have, starting in a new configuration. This is William James's definition of intelligence. Basically, it, it says um, uh, same goal by different means, right? How, how competent is the system? So what we did was we created what we call Picasso tadpoles. So everything is in the wrong place. The eyes on top of the head, the jaws are off to the side, the thing's a complete mess. And if all it was doing was moving each organ in the right direction, the right amount, the frog would be equally messed up because you're starting in an in incorrect configuration. In fact, what we found is that these animals make quite normal frogs because all of this stuff is going to move in novel paths. In fact, sometimes it goes too far and actually has to double back and come back. But all of them will, will move around and rearrange relative to each other until they get to a correct frog face. So what evolution has given us here is not a hardwired system that makes certain movements. It's given us an error minimization scheme that is able to continue to operate until a particular morphological goal has been met. And so it has, um, it has, it has lots of different types of feedback. And so this, this is the kind of uh, paradigm that, that we all learn. It's based on, uh, it's based on uh, genetics and emergence, this idea that <clears throat> the, the cells will, uh, the, the, the gene regulatory networks will create proteins, they interact with each other uh, uh, using local rules, and then eventually there's emergence of complexity, something, something complex happens like this uh, salamander. Uh, and, and that's true, this does happen, but it's only a part of the story, and I think not even the main part. Uh, the main part is that this hardware that, uh, that is produced has this amazing ability to uh, implement uh, anatomical homeostasis. When the system is deviated uh, by injury, by mutations, by teratogens, pathogens, whatever, when it's, when it's deviated, there are feedback loops that kick in both at the level of uh, transcription and at the level of physics, and this is the one we're going to talk about, uh, that try to get you back to where you need to be. It's an error minimization process, like the thermostat in your house. It's a basic homeostatic loop. Now, the thing about homeostatic loops is that uh, they have to have a set point. So this is a very unconventional, I mean, of course, bi biologists know all about um, feedback loops, but typically these, these feedback loops are scalar. There's a single numbers like pH or you know, hunger level, things like that. Um, here, the set point actually has to be a description of a co fairly complex anatomical structure, not to the individual cell uh, level of detail, but, but you know, a, 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 some, some level of anatomical description. And, and in general, uh, we're not encouraged in biology to think about goals or final states or anything like that. We're encouraged to think about molecular mechanisms and, and how, what the emergent qualities are of, of that complex dynamical system. But here, this, this cybernetic view really forces you to think about, uh, uh, is it possible that the system literally stores a set point of what it's supposed to build? And, uh, and, and, and what it's doing is like any homeostatic system, it tries to reduce the error to that set point. So this is what we've been doing for years now. We've taken this very strong and, and counterintuitive prediction that this thing literally knows what shape it's supposed to grow. And uh, the prediction is that we should be able to find that encoding we should be able to decode it, right? So whatever biophysical um, medium holds it, we should be able to decode it. And then we should be able to rewrite it. And if we rewrite it, something amazing should happen, which is that 
in in typical uh, uh, approach to this to this problem, if you if you believe only in emergence, that means that all your interventions have to be down here. You have to make changes here, maybe with CRISPR, maybe something else. You make changes down here, and 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 eventually they percolate up. But the limiting factor there is for complex you know, beyond single gene diseases, the question is, how do you know which genes to manipulate for a complex outcome? You generally don't, because this, this whole process is not reversible. It's a, it's a really terrible inverse problem. However, if, if there is, in fact, a stored pattern that the, that the, that the cells are working towards, then you've got a different uh, approach. You might be able to change the pattern the way you do in your thermostat when you change the set point. You don't need to know how the rest of the system works. You just need to know how to change the set point and, and rely on it to do what it does best, which is to, 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 to try to get to that set point. So, so here's how we think about this, that basically uh, what evolution has done is scale up using a particular kind of uh, interaction that I'll tell you about sh shortly, um, scale up uh, competent single cell systems into something like this, where the goals get much bigger instead of single cell level goals of metabolism and proliferation. The goal here is to maintain this kind of thing. And if you deviate from that goal, the system will very commonly go back and try to try to build it. But there's a breakdown of that cooperation and that's and that scale up and that breakdown is cancer. So this is this is human glioblastoma cells crawling around. And uh, I'm going to make the argument that what, ha what, what this, this kind of uh, process really is, is a breakdown of this uh, uh, coordination system that is scaling up from, from tiny goals of single cells to anatomical uh, goal states in, a, in an anatomical morphous space. And, and that process breaks down and you get cancer. So <clears throat> that suggests that we ought to be able to uh, uh, you know, th this way of thinking about it, which sort of weaves together embryogenesis, regeneration, and cancer as a, uh, a, a problem of information control, in particular of scaling of goals uh, in biology, uh, suggests this, that, that if we really understood this, we should be able to develop uh, strategies that don't just kill the cancer cells, which are, of course, problematic because you get that compensatory proliferation and to, uh, tumor resistance and all that. Uh, instead of trying to kill them, um, could we try to reconnect them more strongly to this, the signals that normally keep them working together towards making nice organs? Uh, and that requires us to know what are these signals? How do cells remember what the whole thing is supposed to be? Because no individual cell knows how many fingers a salamander limb is supposed to have, but the collective certainly does. So the question is, how does that scaling happen? How do you go from single cell information to uh, large scale anatomical goals. And this is where um, we get into bioelectricity. Now, um, bioelectricity is just one layer of a complex morphogenetic field of information that all cells have access to. I am, I'm going to spend the next uh, half an hour talking about bioelectricity, not because I think bioelectricity is the only thing that matters. All of these things are important. Chemical signals, uh, extracellular matrix, uh, biophysical pressures and tensions and so on. All those things matter. But this is a particularly interesting and important layer, and that's the one that, um, that I'm going to talk about. And this morphogenetic field is, is there uh, guiding the large scale system throughout lifespan from, from basic embryonic development all the way through maintenance, resistance to aging and, and all of that. So, so what are bioelectrical signals? Well, um, <clears throat> every membrane, every, every cell, not just neurons, but every cell in your body has these uh, ion channels uh, and in fact also gap junctions um, uh, in them. And these ion channels let charged molecules in and out. And as a result, you get a voltage gradient across the membrane. So every cell has a voltage gradient um, across that membrane. Now, uh, it just so happens that if you take different kinds of cells, and this is just a small sample of the data, and you put them along, you, you, you sort of throw them on a scale from, from depolarized to hyperpolarized, you get a very interesting relationship. So, so your mature quiescent cell types tend to be up here, strongly polarized. Your proliferative cells, such as embryonic uh, stem cells uh, and, and, and other embryonic types of cells, tend to be down here, as do cancer cells. Now, this is as interesting as this is. I, I, I always hesitate to show this slide because people, people really like this, and it takes uh, away uh, attention from the fact that I don't think any of this is really a single cell level uh, problem. I don't think cancer is a single cell disease, um, but this this kind of uh, focuses your attention on the on the individual voltage of a single cell. But it's actually much more interesting than that. It is true that this voltage um, controls all kinds of cell properties that are important for cancer. It controls differentiation, apoptosis, um, cell migration, um, uh, cell shape, and so on. But but the story is actually much more interesting than 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 this single cell behavior because. <clears throat> As we start to think about how is it that collections of cells can store 
uh, memories of what to do. The, the, the most obvious example of that is the nervous system and the brain. So each of us exists as a, uh, co as a coherent individual over and above the many uh, uh, neurons that are in our brains because, bio because of bioelectrical signaling in, in your brain that serves an important function. It works as a kind of cognitive glue. And what it does is it allows information processing in networks. So while individual cells have these voltage dynamics and so on, what they do is they propagate uh, those electrical states through, through various kinds of synapses, such as these gap junctions, to their neighbors. And it's the movement of these electrical signals through the network that binds them together towards computations that can uh, underlie cognition of a, and, and the appearance of, a, of an individual that is more than the sum of their parts. So, <clears throat> so, so this hardware allows a kind of interesting software. This, is, uh, this group made this amazing video of a, a, a zebrafish, a living zebrafish brain and everything that's, that's going on as this animal thinks about whatever it is that fish think about. And you can see, you can track all the electrical activity and there's this goal of neural, it's, it's called neural decoding, this idea of being able to read out this electrophysiology over time and decode it so that you know what the animal is thinking. You should be able to, I mean, that's the commitment of neuroscience is that from this pattern, you should be able to recover the memories, the goals, the uh, preferences, the behavioral competencies of this animal. They're all encoded in this electrical activity. But it turns out that um, actually every part of your body has these ion channels. Most cells have these electrical synapses with their neighbors. And so, so we wondered, um, could we extend neuroscience beyond neurons and ask the same neural decoding kind of question, uh, except uh, outside of the nervous system, let's say in an embryonic tissue or in a nascent tumor, uh, <clears throat> could we read out the conversations that these cells are having and try to understand what the collective is going to do? Right? By, by tracking the individual voltage states of each cell. And so, so this, is, this is not a model. This is, uh, this is actual data of a voltage um, a sensitive uh, fluorescent dye. This was uh, a technique first developed by my colleague, Danny Adams, who made this um, video of an early frog embryo developing. And the idea is to be able to decode what the collective is going to build. Um, and so I'm going to show you here, this is, uh, this is grayscale, but it's the same idea. It's a voltage reporting dye. And you see here, this, this is a time lapse of a a uh, frog embryo putting its face together, and there's all kinds of interesting things happening. This is one frame from that video. What you see in that frame is that long before the genes come on to pattern the face and long before the anatomy of the face is established, you can read out the pattern that it's going to make in the future. Here's where the eye is going to be. Here's where the mouth is going to be. Here are the placodes. We call this the electric face. It is literally the, uh, the pre-pattern or the tissue memory of what a correct face is supposed to look like. If you perturb this pattern at all, you change the gene expression and then you change the anatomy. This is instructive. It is required for the normal face to take shape. Uh, this, this is a pathological uh, pattern, which um, we'll talk more about this momentarily, which is when we inject human oncogenes and they make a tumor and eventually it starts to um, uh, metastasize. Uh, you can detect the, 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 this process long before it actually happens by tracking the voltage of the cells. And you can see here that these cells have already electrically decoupled from their neighbors. And when they do that, they're basically uh, reverting to a single cell, a, a unicellular ancient past. As far as they're concerned, then the rest of the animal is just environment to them. All they're going to do is, is, is their unicellular goals. They're going to proliferate. They're going to migrate to where metabolically favorable and so on. And so, and so you, can, you can detect this breakdown of, of multicellularity. So what we've been doing is developing tools um, first to, uh, to track uh, and, and characterize these bioelectrical gradients, lots of computational modeling to link them to the ion channels and pumps that are there. Um, <clears throat> and the most important thing, of course, is the, uh, the functional uh, tools to, to, to rewrite the pattern. It's one thing to read it and be able to see what the, what the, um, uh, uh, the electrical states in the collective are, but, but critically, you have, to, uh, you have to manipulate them and try to write in the, in the language of neuroscience. You're trying to incept false memories into the tissues or change the, the, uh, the electrical pre-patterns that guide their activities. So the way you do that, <clears throat> we don't use any kinds of applied fields. There are no uh, uh, electrodes, there are no magnets, there are no electromagnetic waves or radiation, nothing like that. What we're using is we're exploiting the native interface that cells expose to each other. This is how the cells program each other natively in the body. They're, they're using this interface of these ion channels and these gap junctions, <clears throat> and we can use them too. We can use pharmacological, molecular, genetic, 
um, or in fact optical with optogenetics, we can we can uh, control the gap junctions and we can turn the channels on and off in spatial patterns, and thus we can imprint new bioelectrical memories into tissues. Now the now now the next question is well, what happens when you do that, right? What's the what's the evidence that these patterns are actually instructive for anything? Uh, couldn't they just be a um, uh, a, a readout of housekeeping physiology, you know, an epiphenomenon. How do we know they matter? Well, we know they matter because because now that we have these tools, uh, we can start to rewrite the pattern. I'm going to show you what happens when you rewrite the pattern. So um, <clears throat> one thing you can do, I showed you the electric face, which has a particular kind of pattern that says that that determines where the eye is going to be built. Well, we can recapitulate that pattern somewhere else. We can put it anywhere on the embryo that we want. When you do that, uh, so you inject. In this case, we inject an RNA for a specific uh, potassium channel that that sets that 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 little voltage pattern. And wherever those those cells get that information, they will build an eye. For example, they might have been gut cells before. But if you tell them to build an eye, they will build an eye. Now, that, those eyes will have all the right lens, retina, optic nerve, all the, all the right stuff that, um, that belongs there. Um, note, note the incredible modularity. This is, uh, the, we, we didn't provide enough information of how you build an eye. We didn't try to control gene expression levels or all the different stem cells that need to happen or all the different uh, morphogenetic uh, movements. We didn't say any of that. We provided a very simple bioelectrical pattern that serves as a subroutine call. All it does is it, 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 it encodes for the rest of the cells, it encodes the information, build an eye right here. And in fact, so this is a, a, a cross section through a lens um, created this way. What happens is the blue cells are marked with beta galactosidase. They're the ones we actually injected. If there's not enough of them to build an eye, they will actually recruit their neighbors. All this other stuff out here that's making this nice lens was never uh, manipulated by us in any way. It's only the blue cells that we targeted. So. So you see one of the competencies here, not only is, is, there a, is there a subroutine you can call to make a complex organ, but actually if you don't hit enough cells, they will have a conversation with their neighbors and recruit them the way that another collective intelligence, for example, ants, will also recruit their buddies if they come across something that's too big of a job for, for, for the few of them. Uh, it scales to the task at hand uh, automatically. We didn't have to do anything for that. The, the body already does it. We tell these cells to make an eye, and they tell their neighbors that you guys need to participate so that we can all make a properly shaped lens. So if you do that, you can make uh, you can make ectopic four brains here. This is what a normal frog brain looks like. You can make extra limbs, uh, lots of extra limbs. You can make ectopic beating hearts. You can make otocysts, which are uh, inner ear sort of balance organs. Um, and you can even make fins. Now that's interesting because tadpoles aren't supposed to have fins. That's more of a more of a fish thing. But we'll 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 talk about that. And um, and you can also you can also use this technique to repair birth defects. So just just kind of very very briefly, this is the pattern that indicates what a frog brain should look like and the size and shape of it. And um, it's got a very particular voltage characteristic. If you sort of scan along this line, it kind of looks like this bell curve. And what we figured out is that. Uh, there are many teratogens, for example, nicotine, alcohol, think fetal alcohol syndrome, things like that. But what they do is they ruin this nice, uh, nice pattern. So they'll flatten it out either here or here. And in either case, you get severe brain defects. And so we made a computational model of this process, as in what happens to the bioelectrics under various perturbations. And we asked the model, if the bioelectric pattern is wrong, how would we fix it? In other words, what channel would we open or close to get the pre-pattern back to the right place. So, so keep in mind, this isn't uh, at, at this point, what, what we're doing here, this is, this is rational repair. We're not uh, uh, taking random shots in the dark. We're not um, trying to, to ruin an existing pattern. We're actually trying to use our computational simulator of bioelectric uh, uh, gradients to ask how to repair a complex organ when it's been, uh, when it's been damaged. And, and this model, uh, pr uh, proposed one specific thing, which is this, which is this uh, a very interesting channel called HCN2. And when you activate these HCN2 channels, sure enough, uh, an embryo that's been that's that here's here's what a normal brain looks like: forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. Um, uh, this is this is a, a an embryo actually now. Now this is this is much worse than being hit with a teratogen. This is a a mutation in a gene called Notch. Notch is a really important neurogenesis gene. If you mutate Notch. There is no forebrain, the midbrain and hindbrain are a big bubble. These animals have no behavior. They just lay there doing nothing. Uh, on top of this mutation, if you impose the right bioelectrical pattern, and this was done by opening the HCN2 channel, which in turn was suggested by the computational model, you rescue brain shape, 
you rescue brain gene expression and you even rescue their IQ. So their learning rates, um, we, we, we check their IQs by, by learning and uh, training them in various assays, they get their IQs back. So now this is, this is quite amazing. And you can do this by, uh, um, molecularly, uh, molecular genetically, meaning, meaning yeah, put in new HCN2 uh, channels, which would be uh, gene therapy, or you can do it with drugs that open existing HCN2 channels. So these happen to be two anti-epileptics that open the HCN2 channel and you can do this rescue. I'm not claiming that that you that this will work for everything, but the amazing thing about this example is that there's a hardware problem. They literally have a mutant notch signaling pathway, in which case things go terribly wrong. But that hardware problem is fixable in software by going back in and telling these cells what the correct pattern is. And so, and and I think that's very powerful. And so, so th so that's an example of of repairing birth defects. Here's an example of. Um, uh, some of our regenerative, um, uh, some of our regenerative work because frogs by themselves do not regenerate uh, their legs uh, after they lose them. But we've we've come up with a cocktail that actually induces uh, a pro-regenerative pro blastema with MSX1, and then eventually by 45 days, instead of nothing, you start to get toes and a, and a toenail, and then eventually a pretty respectable leg that's touch sensitive and motile. This whole uh, this whole interaction with our with our uh, ion uh, um, ionophore cocktail took 24 hours, and then the leg can grow for a year and a half without us touching it. <clears throat> it's not about micromanaging where the stem cells go or what the pattern is. It's about uh, communicating to the cell collective very early on. You're going to take the path through morphous space that goes towards leg building, not the path that goes to scarring and um, and 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 a stump. So we are now, uh, and I have to do a disclosure here because uh, Dave Kaplan and I are co-founders of this company called Morphoceuticals, where we're trying to apply that same strategy to, uh, to mammals and hopefully eventually to, to human patients. Um, of course, we're quite, quite far from that still, but okay. So, so the summary of, of, of everything that I've said so far is that like in the brain, the mechanism that binds cells towards large scale common purpose, meaning to upkeep, to create and upkeep uh, against aging, against cancer, um, complex organs are specifically bioelectrical networks. Modifying the information processed by these electrical networks offers some really uh, high level, meaning creating new organs, fixing complex organ shapes and so on, control over growth and patterning without genomic editing, without bottom up trying to engineer all of the pathways that are that are involved in this. The, we're, we're, we're harnessing the, the competencies of the system, like recruiting other cells, like size control, shape control, and all that. And so now, and so now here we get um, finally to um uh, and you can you can you can read about um, all the all the details here. But we're finally getting now to uh, the part that's directly uh, directly about cancer. So um, <clears throat> if, if these bioelectrical signals are important for cancer, then, then four things should be true. First of all, there should be some implication by molecular data of ion channel pumps and proteins in cancer. Uh, bioelectric signatures should be a viable diagnostic tool for detecting tumors early. Um, we should be able to induce cancer-like phenotypes by disrupting proper VMEM gradients. And best of all, uh, in, in, in cancer-like phenotypes should be suppressible by the modulation of VMEM gradients. So these are all these are all predictions of this view that bioelectrics is the mechanism that binds individual cells towards organogenesis and away from the kind of single cell behavior that we see uh, among among cancer cells. So. These these data now are actually are actually quite 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 old, and I should update this. But even by 2016, it was already seen. There's this there's this kind of uh, uh, a very rapid rise of the number of of papers implicating various ion channels in cancer, and there are lots of uh, uh, bona fide oncogenes implicated in both in human patients and and in mouse models, and of course in in frog and zebrafish and so on, um, that uh, that are pointing to a direct functional role. Of various ion channels. So this is this is the kind of molecular biology data. You can you can scan databases. So so here is uh, here's from a from a, um, a, 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 a geo database that 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 looks at uh, the expression of certain channels during. And so you can see here here's a particular ion channel, and here it is in normal cells and benign nevi. And then boom, by the time you get to malignant uh, uh, malignant cells, it's it tends to be it tends to be shut off. So, so, so yes, there's evidence implicating ion channel genes and so on in the process of cancer, but the genes aren't key, and this is really important. We cannot just think about oncogenes the way we think about transcription factors and, and growth uh, regulators and cell cycle checkpoints and so on. It's the physiological state that matters here. And so what I mean by that is 
I've shown you that that we can we can induce we can we can take different kinds of oncogenes, uh, hu human oncogenes, throw throw them in a frog embryo, and they and they will create tumors. You can detect them early by using this voltage dye, and we've, we were of course working on this as a diagnostics modality because uh, you can see immediately that that the first thing these oncogenes do is they shut down the electrical connectivity between cells and, the, and their neighbors. As soon as the, that, that connectivity is shut down, these cells are out of the network that processes large scale information, like, hey, you should be part of a nice liver or skin or whatever. And they're back to a local tiny uh, um, set of goals that, that, that their unicellular ancestors had. And so these, uh, co contrary to a lot of models in, in, of cancer and game theory and so on, these cells are not more selfish. It's not that they're more selfish. It's that their self is tinier. It's much smaller. It's now down to their, their computational boundaries, now down to the size of a single cell. Whereas before, when they were electrically connected into this network, they were part of uh, something that, uh, that was working on much bigger projects, you know, these anatomical constructions. And so you could imagine, and this is, this is an artist's rendering, but this is one of the things that we're working on, is this kind of like... Um, augmented reality device where you can imagine during surgery, the doctor's wearing these goggles and they can, the, the surgeon can see the, the area of course, but overlaid onto the anatomy is a, an AI processed probability uh, landscape that shows based on the electrical signaling. So there's a voltage sensitive dye in there. Um, and these are these are not you know generally very well well tolerated these dyes and <clears throat> so you should you should be able to look down and see okay here's here's where the major the major tumor is but actually these cells up here are leaving the the collective as well and, and you better you better get them so okay so so that's that's our story of uh, of of the diagnostic potential of this uh, now here's the second thing I promised which is um, can you actually induce a cancer phenotype. Uh, by disrupting the bioelectric. So this is a normal tadpole head. These little black cells are melanocytes. And here's what normal, uh, the normal complement of melanocytes looks like. And what we did was we disrupted the electrical communication between uh, a, a, a very specific cell type. We call them instructor cells for obvious reasons you'll see in a minute, uh, and these melanocytes. There are, there are no oncogenes here. There are no carcinogens. There's no mutation, no DNA damage. There's nothing wrong with the hardware of these, of these animals. They haven't been exposed to any, any carcinogens. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with them, except that we've uh, temporarily uh, perturbed the, commu the, the communication between these, uh, these pigment cells and this other cell population. When you do that, the pigment cells go completely wild. They over proliferate. You can see here, they've taken over like this normal periocular space that's normally quite clear. They've taken over there everywhere. In fact, these animals turn pitch black. There's, there's melanocytes everywhere. If you take a section through them, this is the neural tube here, and you can see one, two, three, four, these small numbers no normally in normal embryos, small numbers of these nice round little melanocytes well, when the bioelectric signals aren't there to tell them what to do, they go crazy. They revert back to their um, original kinds of um, behaviors. They, they change shape drastically. They, they acquire these long projections. They're exploring their environment. They're digging into the neural tube to the, um, to the nerve tissue itself, to the lumen inside the, the space. They, they just invade all the organs. Here you can see the blood vessels. So normally quite clear, these blood vessels. Here we go. The melanocytes are, are, are hitting the, the vasculature and propagating through it. This is basically a full-on metastatic melanoma in these guys. Um, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's, there are no genetic defects. There are no, uh, if you were to sequence the, the genome, you would not see any, any uh, mutations, nothing like that. Although by these, by, by this stage, you, you will see things like, um, uh, markers of, uh, of epithelial and mesenchymal transition and things like that. Um, now, uh, the, the, and, and so this works also in human melanocytes exactly the same way. They, they will go completely crazy if you, if you uh, disrupt their, their bioelectrical state. Now, now, here's the most interesting thing to keep in mind. Um, here's, again, the cross-section, and here are these crazy melanocytes that are digging in and taking over the brain and so on. Um, these are not the cells that we manipulated. These blue cells out here are the ones that we manipulated. This is not a cell autonomous event, meaning that the thing that goes crazy is not this, the, the, the cell whose voltage has been perturbed, it's other cells in the environment. It's the importance, and of course, I'm not the first person to talk about the importance of the microenvironment, but in particular, the bioelectrical properties of the microenvironment are the switch that leads from normal melanocytes into this crazy uh, converted melanoma-like behavior. And, and the way it works, and I won't, have to, I won't have time to go through all this, but it's actually a serotonergic signal 
that normally goes from these instructor cells to the melanocytes. And if you perturb the bioelectrics of this instructor cell, that uh, serotonergic um, uh, process uh, goes awry, and and these these melanocytes are are left on their own, and they do what they do. They over they like what they do. What every amoeba does, they over proliferate. They crawl wherever they feel like. They take over the the environment. And and we've studied um, in great detail on um, this this whole serotonergic pathway and the downstream gene expression and then the. the the gene regulatory network and so on, but 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 the uh, the importance of this part of the talk is 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 this um, <clears throat> this uh, one way to get cancer. I'm not saying it's the only way, but but one uh, significant way to to have a, a, a carcinogenic transformation is to uh, have cells that are isolated uh, from the electrical information that normally keeps them orchestrated towards uh, towards proper functionality and, and morphogenesis and so on. And, um, and oncogenes trigger this, but there are other ways, uh, there are other ways to trigger this. Okay, so, so the final thing I wanna show you is the thing that we actually want, we don't want uh, to, to create more, more cancer, obviously we want, a, we want a, a treatment modality. So, so, here, so, so here it is. So, so one of the things we can do is we can inject these oncogenes, even nasty KRAS mutations and so on. Um, the oncogene is labeled with fluorescent uh, red protein, in this case, tomato, so you can see it. Uh, here it is. And what we know is that if we co-inject a particular ion channel, RNA, that we've chosen to resist, to, to, to basically fight. So, so what this oncogene is going to do is it's going to try to tell the cells to uh, depolarize and, and disconnect from their neighbors. The, this ion channel is going to dominate that. And it's going to say, fine, you have the oncogene, uh, but, but you're not going to be able to depolarize. We're going to keep you connected to all of the neighbors. So, so here, this is the same animal. So, so here's the bolus of, of where the oncoprotein uh, was expressed. In fact, it's all over the place. You know, there's, 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 if you sequence this and you say, wow, this thing is full of um, this, this oncogene, definitely going to make a tumor, and there is no tumor. Because what drives the outcome is not the, the genetic state, it's the physiological state. And if you manage, now I've already shown you an example of this. I've shown you um, in, the, in the frog brain, right? You, you could have a notch mutation, and if you sequence it, the prediction would be, well, you're going to have terrible defects. But that's not actually what drives. What drives is the bioelectric state. And so, so you can override this, this hardware defect with a particular uh, physiological state. And then, and then these same cells, they're not dead. They're not, they don't die. They, they just continue participating in normal morphogenesis. Now you can do this with light. Here's an example of optogenetics. So, so we just use um, optogenetic technology that we, that we took from, from neuroscientists. And you can, you can knock down the incidence of, of these tumors significantly by using light to trigger the right kind of channel. In fact, um, <clears throat> here is, here's a normal tadpole and here's the tail. Whether you get a tumor and 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 this uh, the you know these kind of uh, metastatic events, whether you get a tumor or whether you get an ectopic eye, is determined by the amount of sodium in the medium. Because in this case we were using a sodium uh, uh, ion channel to do this, and the sodium ion channel it's not like a transcription factor that always has the same effect. It's a it's a physiological. Um, uh, it's, it's an element of, of physiology that, that in part its activity de de is, depends on how much sodium there is. So whether you get a tumor or an eye is actually determined by a physiological parameter, namely how much sodium is in the medium, not at the level of DNA damage or anything like that. And so putting, putting all this together, our um, uh, kind of uh, our, our framework for, for addressing all this is, is uh, this, uh, this idea of electroceuticals, of using existing ion channel drugs with our computational models that tell us what's going to happen when you open and close certain channels. You know which channels there are because, of course, human tissues are extensively profiled. So that feeds into the model. The one thing that is largely missing today is the physiomics of what are the correct bioelectrical states for all the organs. We actually have no idea for, for humans, um, and, and we only know this for certain animal model systems. So, so this is where a lot of the work has to happen, is actually to understand what the correct bioelectrical state is. But then we have a simulator that can tell you how to get from the wrong state to the correct state. And that helps you pick from, from existing, from a huge library, something like 20% of all drugs are ion channel drugs. It's a, potentially a huge library of, of electroceuticals, and so you can you can play with this a little bit. This is uh, this is online, uh, kind of our the beginnings of this of this platform. It's it's uh, for, you know freely accessible. You can pick different types of uh, tissues. You can you can pick um, you know either cancerous or normal. It will tell you what channels there are. If you uh, pick specific channels, it'll tell you what drugs because because you can search a drug bank and so on. Uh, it'll tell you what uh, what what drugs you might want to use. And so we've begun this process. So now moving this from from frog and and so on. This is this is our first um, 
uh, uh, paper on, on the human glioblastoma, it's in vitro. And what we're using is some of these drugs that, uh, that, that were picked by this process that I just told you on uh, glioblastoma cells. And, and there are all kinds of interesting um, uh, effects in terms of uh, uh, preventing proliferation, in terms of partial uh, reprogramming, to so, so differentiation, possibly normalization. So stay tuned. This is very much work in progress. And, and of course, we need, we need in vivo experiments. But we're slowly moving now into, uh, into uh, mammalian. Uh, context. So, so, so here's the here's the summary of the whole thing. Uh, <clears throat> cancers are fundamentally a disorder of the scaling of cellular competencies. Uh, individual cells can get certain goals met, for example, overgrowth and, and migration. But in normal bodies, they are they are kept harnessed towards much larger, sort of grandiose anatomical um, goals. But this process can break down, and that process is mediated by bioelectrical signaling which is why bioelectrics can be used to detect, induce, and reprogram uh, uh, cancer cell behavior. Um, just like in the nervous system, uh, we can instruct uh, cell behavior without having to change the genome. This is also true in, in, in learning and, and, and all the th amazing things that nervous systems do. They don't, you, you don't need to change your genome to learn new things or to acquire new goals and so on. And we are now developing pharmacological and optical strategies uh, towards discovery of electroceuticals for normalizing cancer. And, and, and there's a huge role for machine learning and AI and, and so on, but also for getting this uh, physiomic data that basically um, has, has, has been neglected in, in, uh, in favor of uh, transcriptomics and proteomics and so on. So, so the future directions, what, what we and our partners are working on is to refine that physiological signature. So optical non-invasive diagnostics for precancer and also tumor margins and surgery. Um, to refine control methods for voltage in, in mammalian systems. And uh, specifically, the, the bigger picture here is to crack the bioelectric code to induce normalization towards normal tissues and organs using ion channel drugs that are already in human use, meaning they're already approved. Um, so uh, I will stop here. I want to thank uh, the uh, students and postdocs that did all the work, uh, our, our many collaborators. Um, our technicians, our, our, our funders. Uh, I have to do two disclosures. So Morphoceuticals is the limb regeneration company. Astonishing Labs is a company that we're doing all the cancer um, diagnostics with. Um, and uh, most of all, uh, thank the animal model systems because they do all the heavy lifting. So um, thank you. And I will take questions.